All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Eve, and welcome to Gardening for Climate Change. Uh, before we get into the content, we just want to give you a little bit of a background on Grow NYC. We are an environmental nonprofit here in New York City. We protect the environment, create green spaces, help people stay healthy, and give them opportunities to make a positive impact. Um, we're most well known for our green markets, Union Square, Grand Army Plaza. Um, we have over 50 markets throughout all five boroughs, but we do a whole lot of other things centered around conservation, green spaces, education, and food access and agriculture. And you can learn more about us on growNYC.org. Um, in today's workshop, you can submit questions using the Q&A function. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this um, and we'll send you a follow-up email uh, with the recording with the um, and with some other information that might be helpful to you afterwards. And feel free to use the chat function. All right. So let's get started with just a little background about our work, who we are and what we do. Um, so all of your presenters tonight are uh, the staff from Grow NYC's Teaching Garden. Um, the Teaching Garden is one acre, um, diversified fruits and vegetables and flowers. Uh, we're on Governor's Island off the tip of Manhattan. Um, we're mostly an educational space. So we have some photos here from uh, one of our field trips. We host field trips for students of all ages. Um, out at our garden where they get to interact with the plants and the dirt and the bugs and all of that good stuff. Um, we're also open on the weekends to the public um, and we have a farm stand. We do some farm tours and workshops and things like that. Um, and then any produce or, or flowers that are not used during our field trip and on our weekend hours um, are donated to mutual aid organizations. So you can see in the Third picture on the slide, uh, this is one of our harvests for one of our mutual aid partners this year. Um, so throughout the presentation today, we're gonna draw on examples from our work and our space, um, which if you're interested, you can come and visit on the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, 12 to four. All right, so in this workshop, um, we are going to focus on gardens and how they are impacted by climate change. We're going to discuss how to adapt your garden or a small gardening space to the changing climate and how to introduce these topics to others through education. And then before we begin, we'd like to introduce you to our team at the Teaching Garden. We all work together to maintain the garden, teach classes, host volunteer groups, and um, public outreach like uh, on the weekends, we're open from 12 to 4. Um, we're very excited to be here with you today. My name is Aubrey, and I'm the Education Coordinator at the Teaching Garden. And my name is Chloe. I'm the Farm Coordinator at the Teaching Garden. Eve, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, my name is Eve, I'm the program manager, and Genevieve is not with us today, but you can meet her Saturdays, 12 to 4, if you're interested. And I'll just pop on. I'm Laura. I'm not from the Teaching Garden, but I am on the education team with the rest of them. I work with the School Gardens program. Great. So we're going to jump right into it um, and talk about climate change pressures. So we kind of assume that if you're here um, you have an understanding of climate change, you um, acknowledge that it's a real thing, but we just want to go over a few areas of how climate change will directly impact gardening and farming. So there are three measures we're going to look at. Growing degree days, which has to do with the average number of degrees per day, degrees over 41 degree Fahrenheit per day in a season. So it's just, it's kind of just the season available for plants to grow and mature. mature. Uh, yes, the slideshow will be shared uh, afterwards. And then plant hardiness zones, which is kind of the cold hardiness of plants. And then heat zone max, which has to do with the number of days per year above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're gonna take you out, out of this PowerPoint for a second to show you um, kind of a cool graphic. So, the left side of this um, image is showing you 1980 to 2009, the um, temperatures, and obviously the lighter colors are 
cooler temperatures. The darker colors are warmer temperatures. The right side is 2070 to 2099. So those are projections of what uh, the number of growing tree days will be in the future. And you can see pretty much around the board, it's projected to get hotter. <laughs> Not a surprise at all. Um, in New York, you might think that that would be helpful for farming and gardening because it's cooler here. Maybe we'll have longer seasons, but this map isn't taking into account um, changing changes in precipitation, which can affect farming and gardening. And then if you scroll down a little bit, we'll look at the plant hardiness zones. And again, we are getting hotter. So it suggests that the seasons, growing seasons will increase in all areas. Um, winter temperatures are rising and that trend is expected to continue. And then the last one is um, heat zones. And you can see, again, we're getting hotter. If you're interested, you can take a look at this website when we send you the um, the slideshow later. It's pretty interesting. But overall, it is getting hotter. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about how, um, how that will affect your garden or your farm. So we'll come back to the PowerPoint now. Okay. Um, so now that we have the same kind of shared context and vocabulary for the rest of the presentation, um, we're going to go over a handful of topics um, related to climate change in our space. Um, how we handle them and how we teach about them during our trips. The first one that we're gonna talk about um, is insects and animals. Um, and this is one of the major changes that we've seen in the teaching garden related to climate, even in the last five years. So um, one of our main categories here is insects, right? Um, insects, we are talking about good insects, beneficial insects, and also pests. Um, but in general, um, when we have a mild winter, like the one that we just had and the one that's um, projected for this coming winter, um, a lot of the insects' life cycles are disrupted. Um, and that is to say that uh, instead of slowing down, going dormant, or even the populations dying back um, when it is cold, that's not happening and the populations continue to boom. Um, so in the teaching garden, um, this means we might need to adjust what we're planting, when we're planting. Um, this photo is an example. These are cabbage worms. Cabbage worms, um, if you grow any brassicas, so your kales and cabbage and collards and um, broccoli, all of those things um, in the summer likely will have cabbage worms. Uh, what we're seeing now is because the cycle of life cycle of the cabbage worm is about three to six weeks. Um, when it's warm all year round, they have many more generations and therefore a much stronger presence in the garden than when we have a cool, a cold winter and they can slow down. Um, so when we have too many cabbage worms, uh, we plant our seedlings sometimes and you come in the next day and they've eaten all of the leaves off of it. Um, so we need to adjust what we're planting and when. And then another um, related topic, uh, which could be a, a whole presentation in and of itself, is invasive species. Um, I'm curious, uh, does anybody recognize what's who is in this picture? If you do, you can throw it in the chat. Um, this is a, a hot topic these days. Um, this is the spotted lanternfly. This is before they are adults. Um, so it's important to recognize all the life stages. Um, I do want to address not just the spotted lanternfly, but you know we use this term invasive species um, and sometimes we use it incorrectly. Um, so I want to define it. Uh, an invasive species is only categorized as such if it meets these three criteria, which is that they can easily adapt to a new area, they can reproduce quickly, and the important one, they harm property, the economy, or the native plants and animals of the region. So that one sometimes takes a little bit longer to recognize or realize. Um, but basically, uh, spotted lanternfly definitely reaches the first two. Um, 
but it's interesting because in our space we've uh actually seen very little uh noticeable damage to our plants that are covered in these lantern flies um they excrete some some sticky stuff we're not sure about long-term effects yet um but this can be kind of a dangerous uh, term to use if we're not sure it's correct or not. Um, we're also seeing a lot of predators um, to, to the lanternfly in the last year or so. We've seen chickens eat them. We've seen praying mantis, um, different kinds of wasps. So natural predators are one way to keep this population in check and perhaps prevent them from being an invasive species and meeting that final uh, bullet point there. All right, so we focus a lot on farm friends and foes at the teaching garden through various lessons and experiential learning. Uh, sometimes the lanternfly will jump on a student and they'll freak out and we'll discuss it. Um, others are our field ob observations of insects that we find in the garden. So we take magnifying glasses and we tour various places in the teaching garden that we can identify farm friends and foes. Um, enemies include, but not are, but are not limited to lanternflies, aphids, mosquitoes, caterpillars, squirrels, and rats. Um, and our friends that we may see along the way are our decomposers, our pollinators, and bugs that eat harmful bugs, and possibly a killdeer that has laid her her nest in one of our rows. So the objective of these lessons are to emphasize ecosystem balance. Um, and then throughout the lesson, the concept of balance in ecosystems is reinforced and students can come to understand that all components of nature, including insects, play vital roles, roles that often benefit one another in complex ways. Um, and so when we do see those lantern flies, we, we don't want to teach them to squish them because um, we don't really know if they're, if they're truly invasive and we don't we want to prevent them from possibly squishing other beneficial insects. Um, and then also students can learn how farmers work through um, uh, farms, insects, birds, and mammals through organic practices. And then our, our other um, garden animal and insect is rodents. Um, if you garden in New York City, I'm sure there's some type of either rat or squirrel or some kind of rodent uh, having a little buffet in your garden. Um, this is a picture of our winter squash from last year. Uh, I would say they ate 80% of it. Uh, so rats, again, they do breed year round. Um, they do slow down in the winter, only if there are three weeks of freezing temperature. Um, that is enough time for rats, biologically speaking, to make a decision that um, there might not be enough food to raise young right now. Um, so in years with mild winters, we often see a spring with a booming rat population that's higher than a year with a really cold winter. Um, so yeah, rats love to chew up everything in the garden, um, including our irrigation lines and our fruits and veggies. Um, they can be really tough to discourage, but there are a couple of things that we can do that we'd like to talk about in our next slide. Um, so Overall, you know, it sounds like climate's getting warmer, so we have all of these new or continuing pest problems for uh, the garden and things are getting worse, um, but there are things that we can do. Uh, for insects, one of the main things we do is we use row cover, um, and you can see that in the top picture here, the white fabric. Um, row cover, it's just a really thin, breathable fabric. The sun can go through it. You can water through it but it's tight knit enough to present, prevent insects from going through. Um, so we sometimes cover like vulnerable seedlings. Um, so this is a picture of our bok choy, which often gets eaten up when it's really young. So we just cover it as soon as we plant it. Um, and that's just with some metal hoops and the rene covering up. And that prevents any, in, any flying insects uh, from landing, laying eggs, chewing on the leaves, anything like that. Um, we also use crop rotation. So we make sure not to plant uh, the same plant family in the same place two years in a row. That's the most simple way to think about it. And that can just disrupt um, insects life cycle, especially for insects like beetles who will lay eggs in the ground and the grubs for beetles can't really travel that far. So if their preferred food is not available, they're not likely to thrive. Um, 
companion planting and beneficial native insects. These are two things that Aubrey's going to chat about in a little bit. And then for rodents, um, there's, again, not too much you can do. They're pretty uh, hardy. But one thing you can do is if you're just building out a garden, you can start off really well by covering um, underneath your soil in a raised bed with some hardware cloth. Uh, if that's not an option, you can do what we did in this picture with our watermelons here, which is actually just covering the fruit with hardware cloth. Um, and they can't chew through that. They can't fit through that. That's a one quarter inch hardware cloth. So this worked really well to protect our watermelons this year. Um, and you can do it for pretty much any, you could cover a whole plant with it um, because your pollinators can get right through there. So that's a good solution. Uh, we also sometimes fill existing rat tunnels. So if we see a hole, we see it's right next to our bed where they're eating all of our fruits. Um, we might just fill in that hole with some sand and you know, it kind of just discourages them because it's harder to dig through and they'll, they'll often go someplace else. And then what not to do, um, you may already know this, but two things that we really try to avoid is uh, one, to not introduce any invasive predators. Um, we don't encourage purchasing any insects. Often they are not native. Um, like when you buy ladybugs online, sometimes they're the Asian lady beetles, which will actually outcompete your native insects. Um, and they can also introduce diseases to other insects in your garden. Um, they're often raised on farms, like farm conditions, um, and you just don't have control over what else they're bringing in with them. Um, another invasive species uh, that we discourage is cats. Um, some farms, a lot of farms, will have a cat as like a mouser. We discourage that. Cats are terrible for our wild bird populations. Um, please keep your cats inside. What you can do is use cat hair or like a natural cat litter that has been used by a cat um, just to signal that there is a predator around and that's often enough to discourage your rats and squirrels. And then lastly, and hopefully obviously, please never use poisons. Um, you can't target a single species with a poison. It moves up the food chain. Um, so, you know, you can't really only uh, manage the pest. You'll also hurt your beneficials. Um, and obviously poisons also can seep into the water and the soil. So if you're growing a vegetable garden, you absolutely you know, want to avoid that. All right, so in this slide, we're going to discuss companion planting, which is based on the idea that certain plants, uh, plant combinations can help deter pests, attract beneficial insects, improve soil quality, and increase your overall garden productivity. So some plants naturally repel pests through their scent or chemical compounds. Uh, by interplanting these repellent plants with susceptible crops, you can create a natural barrier that deters pests from your garden. Uh, for example, we use marigolds at the garden, as well as nasturtiums, and they emit a strong scent that repels aphids and nematodes. You'll find um, the nasturtiums and the marigolds planted almost at every bed. Um, you can use alliums like garlic and onions, and those also deter a wide range of pests, um, including aphids, cabbage moths, and carrot flies. Um, and other herbs like basil or ro rosemary can also help repel mosquitoes and flies. Um, and then certain companion plants attract beneficial insects like ladybugs, lacewings, lace and parasitic wasps, which feed on garden pests. Um, and then these beneficial insects can help control pest populations naturally. Uh, companion planting can also involve planting crops together based on their growth patterns and needs, as well as using plants as trap crops, trap crops, which are specifically used to divert pests away from the main crop. Um, so maybe you'll plant a flower along with your tomato plants or basil with your tomato plants. Um, and then companion planting can be, a, can be part of a larger strategy that includes crop rotation and succession planting. By rotating crops and strategically planting companion plants, you can disrupt the life cycles of pests and reduce the buildup of a specific pest population in your soil. And then that leads us into the topic of nesting habitats, which are intentionally created or preserved areas designated to offer suitable nesting sites for those beneficial insects that you're trying to 
while we're in your garden, especially native poll pollinators and native bees. So nesting habitats, what are they? Um, well, they provide numerous benefits to insects and when combined with some no-till farming methods can contribute to sustainable and environmentally friendly agricultural practices. So by creating nesting habitats, oh, sorry, I don't think I said, so they're intentionally created or preserved areas to, uh, designated to offer suitable nesting sites. Um, so by creating these, you are actively contributing to the conservation of natural habitats and biodiversity. Um, many native pollinators and beneficial insects rely on these specific nesting sites, making your efforts vital to the overall health of your garden, your ecosystem. And then by creating these habitats, you're supporting pollinators, including native bees and solitary bees who play a crucial role in, our, in pollinating many of our crops. You're supporting diverse pollinator species who have unique nesting preferences like ground nests or cavities in wood or plant stems. And then you're also consistently um, ensuring that those habitats are there year round. And then you're also aiding in nat natural pest control like we had talked about. So examples of these good nesting habitats, um, as you can see here, a wildflower meadow, we have some goldenrod and asters that are very, look very weedy, but they are very beneficial. Um, we have not pictured is an apple mint patch, um, which is home to solitary wasps that we have that live underground. Um, and these wasps are not aggressive toward humans and are beneficial because they help control pest insect populations. Um, so it's good to be able to identify some of these um, beneficials that you have at your garden so that you know um, they're not harmful or, or if they are. And then, I'll, and then practicing your no-till farming methods. So not pulling plants out, um, instead cutting them, leaving a few inches of stem, um, which are cavities that insects can live in during the winter, cold months. Um, you can have rock or log brush piles, which are natural stu structures that offer various nesting opportunities. You can have decomposing wood or falling logs. Um, and then you'll want to have water sources. And then, of course, you'll want to provide those pollinator friendly plants. So we have these tithonias, which the monarchs are absolutely loving right now. If you go to the teaching garden on the weekends, you can observe many, many monarchs um, drinking the nectar from these uh, tithonias. And then, re in regards to education, um, to engage students in valuable lessons covering nesting habitats, beneficial plants, and pollinators, we employ a diverse range of educational activities. So we introduce the concept of plant parts through flower dissection, which is always really fun. Students can observe and identify the various components of flowers um, and then dive into their all their separate functions. Um, and then for younger students, we take a hands-on approach to pollination by crafting our own pollinators and venturing into the field to explore diverse flowers while actively transferring the pollen. It's really fun in the spring. And then we also engage students um, through a five census scavenger hunt, which you can see them doing on the left picture. Um, students will taste, smell, touch, and observe, observe and listen to, their hap to the happenings around them. Um, and then uh, for older students, we focus on ethnobotany, where we discuss how people of a historic and people historically and currently make use of indigenous plants. We dive into how plants provide food, medicine, shelter, dyes, fabrics, oils, gums, et cetera, and the air we breathe. Um, and so that's always a, a fun tour to do with students. Those are some of our um, curriculum that we do to talk about nesting habitats and beneficial pollinators. Eve, you're muted. Why does that keep happening? Okay, we're gonna switch gears a little and talk about extreme weather and we're gonna start with heat. So um, we all experienced the, the summer this summer. It was very hot. There's a few things you can do um, in your garden to work with the heat um, or at least not have the heat sabotage everything. So one of those is using shade. 
So if you're lucky to have shade in your garden, you can plant things in shade or in partial shade. If you don't have uh, a shady space, our, our teaching garden is very open, a lot of full sun. And we do a few things like using shade cloth to help some plants survive heat waves or um, companion planting, which we talked about earlier. One thing we always do is plant our basil underneath our tomatoes. Basil doesn't really love to be too hot. Then tomatoes get nice and big and can help shade the basil out to keep them a little bit cooler. Um, if you have plants in containers, you can take advantage of the fact that they're movable. So we have a lot of milk crate uh, planters. And when things get really hot, we can move those out of the sun into the shade, vice versa. When it gets uh, cool, we can move things back into the sun. Um, Another thing is how you're watering or when you're watering. So it's always advised to water early in the morning to prevent evaporation and to water deeply. So you wanna water for a long time, as early as possible. We set our irrigation timers to go off, I think between five and 7 a.m. And when it's really hot, uh, if we're having a heat wave, we might water twice a day. You also wanna pay closer attention to potted plants and baby plants because those will need more water um, than established in-ground plants. And then you also want to pay attention to your crop plan and choose plants accordingly. So some plants prefer the heat. They love the, the heat. Um, for example, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, okra, echinacea, yarrow, and coreopsis are all heat lovers. They'll be happy in, in the heat. If it gets way too hot, um, it might cause them to have a slightly smaller yield of fruit. Like if it's a huge heat wave, we might not have as many tomatoes, but um, our tomatoes love the heat. And then native plants uh, are often better adapted to an area's weather, including heat spikes, than non-native plants. So you want to plant native when you can. Um, you can also use mulch. So mulch can help retain soil mo moisture and can also help reflect some heat, keeping the plants and the soil and the roots a little bit cooler. Um, and you also want to avoid unnecessary plant stress. So when it's over 100 degrees out, a plant is already going to be stressed. Pruning, transplanting, and fertilizing are three things you want to avoid. Really, anything that can cause stress to a plant, you want to avoid during a heat wave when the plant is already stressed. Um, so getting rid of weeds, this has an asterisk because not always, but um, weeds are usually better than ornamental plants at surviving and will soak up and snatch up all of the water that your plants need during heat waves. So you want to get rid of um, mugwort or um, other plants with large root systems or that can get really big and take over. But we do leave sometimes a plant like purslane, which spreads out and has really small root systems. And that can actually kind of shade the soil and make it a little bit cooler. So weed and don't weed, I guess, uh, maybe depending on the plant. Um, the urban heat island effect I'm going to talk about in the next slide. And then you also want to be mindful of uh, yourself, right? So take care of yourself when there's heat wave, make sure you're staying hydrated, getting enough rest, taking it easy during the hottest part of the day, um, doing flexible hours. When it's the middle of summer, our staff tries to come at seven and leave at two rather than coming at nine and leaving at four to avoid the real brunt of the heat. And then you want to wear loose, light-fitting clothing. So the next slide is on the urban heat island effect, which you may already be familiar with, but this is just the phenomenon that um, cities and urban areas are often hotter than the surrounding rural or suburban areas, and that's because pavement and asphalt can absorb heat better than, and buildings can absorb and retain heat better than uh, natural spaces like trees and parks. So if you look at this map, you can see Central Park, Prospect Park, very vividly, much cooler than the surrounding areas. So um, urban farms and urban gardens can help to mitigate this effect by creating more areas that are, are a little bit cooler. All right. We'll pass it on to Aubrey for the what the water, flooding and droughts. Flooding and droughts, yes. All right. Or was I going to do this one, Aubrey? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll take it. So hit the next slide. Um, 
So extreme flooding is going to be another thing that we're going to see with climate change. We know that weather patterns um, can change, and this happened a lot this summer. There was a lot of rain that caused flooding. This can lead to root rot. It can lead to soil erosion. It can also lead to an increased pest population um, and some structural damage. So waterlogged plants can suffocate the uh, root systems and cause root rot. Um, it can also, soil erosion is not great because it can cause the topsoil and the nutrients to wash away and can leave your soil compacted. Um, and then some pests uh, love the water. You know, mosquitoes will lay their eggs and um, create habitats when there are little puddles. Um, and all of this is not great because it leads to less food for you and your community. So some ways we can um, adapt to changing weather patterns is with rain gardens. So this is an example of a bioswale, which is like a rain garden. The difference in the bioswale is that this whole area was dug out and filled with gravel, and then the plants were put on top. So uh, all these plants in our bioswale are native perennials. They come back every year. We don't really do much with them, but you can see um, when it floods, a lot of the water um, rushes to this area and these plants are able to suck up all of that excess water. The next picture is really interesting. So our, or sorry, the next slide is really interesting. Our, um, our road about five years ago used to flood like this picture on the left anytime we had um, any significant amount of rain and the trust built three additional bioswells. You can see in the picture on the right, that big tree is part of the bioswell. Um, and now, uh, and there's no bioswell, I don't think yet in the picture on the right. So now when it rains, it never floods like this. It doesn't ever get this deep. If it does uh, flood the road, the water dissipates within a few hours. Um, which is amazing. So I think you're going to see a lot more bioswells in um, like highways and in urban areas as as the future goes on. All right, I'll take it over uh, for rainwater harvesting. So one way to mitigate a uh, combined sewer overflow is to have these rainwater harvesters, and they're also really great for education. Um, so this on the left is a picture of our rainwater harvester at the teaching garden. Um, so this helps us water the garden with non-potable water and incorporate it as an educational component to teach about sustainability. Um, and then picture two is an example of an easy and fairly cheap way to harvest rainwater if you're working with a small space. Many gardeners across New York City collect rainwater this way, um, and it collects from your downspout at your home or your building. And there's many benefits of rainwater harvesting, including uh, conservation of potable water and use non-potable water for your garden. It's very cost effective and can lower your water bills. It can reduce storm water runoff, which prevents erosion, flooding, and pollution in our local waterways. And the result, it results in improved plant health. Um, so it also at the teaching garden provides a backup supply of water during times of drought. So last year we experienced this um, and we could have benefited from having another rainwater harvester that was full. This year, it has not gone empty because of all the rain. So it definitely fluctuates year by year. All right, so at the teaching garden, we offer engaging lessons on rainwater harvesting, bioswales, and rain gardens to foster environmental awareness and sustainable practices. Um, the learning objectives for rainwater harvesting is to understand the significance of rainwater harvesting, to explore the water cycle and the, important, the importance of water conservation, demonstrate proper watering techniques using harvested rainwater. So we'll often make um, either a, a worm compost tea with the rainwater and water our plants or just uh, use the rainwater harvester to water our plants directly. Um, and then we'll often do a sustainability tour where we observe our garden through a sustainability lens. You'll see the picture on the left is of our student, students walking through the path through our bioswale. Um, and they can observe all the natural or the native plants. 
Um, and students will differentiate between renewable and non-renewable energy sources and engage in discussions about organic versus inorganic farming, highlighting the environmental advantages of organic practices. Eve, you're muted. You'd think I would learn that after the third time. All right, we're gonna talk about carbon sequestration now, which is um, the process by which carbon can be stored in the soil. And you can turn your garden into a, gar a carbon sink using these four methods. So this is a lot of stuff we've kind of already mentioned and talked about, but just um, to reiterate that these are really important and helpful things that you can do for climate change um, is using organic practices. So. Uh, Try your best um, not to use any uh, pesticides or um, synthetic fertilizers. We recommend using compost. Um, and for pests, you can use um, like a soapy solution like Dr. Bronner's diluted with water rather than uh, like a harsh chemical. Uh, it's really important to use organic practices so that um, those chemicals don't wash away into our waterways and exacerbate climate change. Um, we also use cover crops. So you can see in the top right photo, a student is applying cover crops. Um, cover crops are great because they can help. We usually plant them in the end of fall to like stay in the ground over the winter. They can help um, add nutrients to your soil. So like uh, peas and uh, peanuts, well, peanuts aren't a cover crop, peas, clover, vetch and rye are some of the cover, cover crops we use. All of those can help fix nitrogen into the soil. They can also um, establish their root systems to prevent um, uh, erosion over the winter, which is great. Um, planting trees and shrubs when you can is amazing. Um, trees and shrubs, as you know, will get bigger every year and they can help to store more carbon um, into the soil and can also provide more green areas and more shade and then using compost. So I mentioned that a little bit with the organic uh, part, but using compost is amazing. And not only using compost in your garden, but composting things. So composting your food scraps, composting your plant scraps, um, these four, four things are great ways to, to prevent climate change from getting worse. All right, so to teach about carbon sinks and carbon sequestration, we focus on FBI and vermicomposting. Um, FBI, we help students identify um, are the three organism, organisms responsible for decomposition and the components needed to feed the process in a compost bin. So we have the fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. Students explore the process of decomposition and build or sift compost, which is always really exciting for them. They like finding the little labels on uh, fruits and veggies and seeing that those haven't decomposed, but all of the fruits and veggies have. Um, we discuss why composting organic material and having nutrient rich soil is beneficial for our gardens and New York City. And we also discuss the nutrient cycle while preparing a garden bed. Uh, one of our most popular lessons is vermicomposting, where students get to learn all about a worm compost bin or vermicomposting is what we call it, where we will observe and interact with the worm compost bin and discuss how worms help decompose food scraps, turning it into black gold for farmers. Um, we'll also learn cool facts about worms and their intricate anatomy while deepening their understanding of the valuable role these invertebra invertebrates play in agriculture and the environment. Um, this is always a fun one. You can create a worm bin in your classroom to monitor during the school year. You can compost those food scraps. And it's really fun to see students who are really afraid of the worms in the beginning, uh, warm up to them and let them, you know, crawl all over them and name them. So it's, it's always a really fun lesson to do with students. All right. Um... That's a lot of information about a lot of different topics, but we want to uh, kind of bring it together with um, some concrete things that you can do in your space or your future space. Um, and one of the main things that you can do um, that's like a useful tool for succeeding during uh, a time of changing climate is choosing the right crops. Um, so 
there are a few things to consider. Um, things on this list, and also I want to add um, for school gardeners, you want to consider the timing of the school year and the timing of your lesson. So a school gardener, you may focus on uh, spring and fall crops. Um, you may want to have like summer perennials or things that can survive with a little less daily care um, if you have less availability during those months. Um, but on top of that, um, some things that we consider are disease resistance, drought tolerance, heat and cold tolerance. Um, these are things that you can usually read right on a seed company website or a seed catalog. Um, it'll tell you about these things in the seed descriptions. So if you have a specific pest or disease issue in your space, um, you can actually research varieties that have a particular resistance. Um, so for example, uh, in the teaching garden, um, historically we have a really big issue with cucumber beetles. Um, the pest pressure is really high. So we have an option to either um, just say, hey, cucumbers don't work in our space or to choose one that has a high resistance to bacterial wilt, which is what cucumber beetles can cause. Um, and then a really interesting one is pest preference. Um, so there are pests that prefer um, different varieties of uh, a plant. So for example, um, when it comes to winter squash, um, the blue Hubbard squash is a really well-known, uh, very popular um, with squash beetles plant. And so if you have a big issue with squash beetles, you can plant this blue Hubbard squash um, as a trap crop, which Aubrey mentioned earlier, which is say, to say you plant that and hope that all of those pests go to that crop and then leave your, say your butternut squash or something like that um, alone. Um, another cool example is uh, if you can think back to those cabbage worms that I showed you in the pest and insect uh, slide in the beginning of the slideshow, um, if you remember, they were bright green. Um, so if you have a big cabbage worm problem, one thing you can do is choose other colors of um, brassica. So you can choose purple cabbage, for example, over green cabbage. And if you do that, these cabbage worms are much more visible to their natural predators, um, like birds. Uh, so the birds can actually help you with that population. Um, and then you can also, if you'd like to consider a uh, type of seed, there's land race and hybrid and heirloom seeds. Um, this is something that if you're interested in, I'm happy to share more with you about via email. Um, but these are really things you should be considering if you're thinking about um, things like breeding plants or saving seeds, um, which may be a little bit of a lofty goal for some of us in our garden space. All right, so let you take a second to absorb those photos. Um, so Chloe was just discussing seed selection for disease resistance and pest issues. So these are pictures of um, corn that we grew last year that struggle with a couple pest problems. Uh, so the first picture, uh, if you can guess, it's from squirrels and birds <laughs> eating them before they fully develop. Um, we tried covering them with paper bags and hand pollinating, um, but that didn't really work. As you can see, all the kernels didn't fully um, pollinate. And then picture two is of the same corn last season that was hit with a fungal pathogen called corn smut. Uh, it lives in the soil for three plus years. So if you have a small space, would recommend not trying to grow corn again as that pathogen lives in the soil still and uh, transfers via wind, water. Um, and since we're an educational garden, this fungus on our corn wasn't a problem and it was kind of a culinary surprise. Um, if you're familiar with it, it's called wheat lojoche and it's very prized. Um, but if you're trying to grow corn, you'll definitely want to practice crop rotation or choose a different variety that's more resistant to that uh, pathogen. Um, and so this taught us that corn isn't well suited for our garden. And if we were concerned about yields, which we're not, we would omit it from our crop plan. However, we love growing corn. We love teaching about the three sisters. Um, and yeah, so we use every opportunity uh, to be a learning opportunity. Uh, we embrace the unpredictability of nature. Um, and that also fosters experiential learning and inquiry-based learning for your students. 
Um, we also uh, use transplanting, seeding, and plant parts to teach students um, about crop varieties. We observe different plant parts. We learn how to seed or transplant seeding seedlings and why we might choose one over the other. Um, we under, we uh, work to understand the plant life cycle. And then with older students, we'll discuss heirloom varieties, hybrid varieties, open pollination, and other uh, more extensive topics like that. Uh, all right, and then um, I just wanted to share some of our go-to crops uh, at in our space. If you're in New York City in a similar space, these may also work for you. Um, again, happy to share more via email. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but these are some of our like tried and true will work for us crops. And um, in general, in our space, um, because like Eve mentioned, we're pretty much full sun. Um, we go for heat tolerance very often um, because we're in educational space. We often look for crops that have a long harvest window. So for example, root crops that um, can sit in the ground for a number of weeks and still be delicious. Um, and of course, lots of flowers, um, different shapes and colors, things, varieties that have some educational value um, on top of uh, their food production. Yeah, and so Chloe highlighted uh, our crop selection process for the teaching garden, but I'd also like to add that we intentionally choose varieties that educate both students and the public about our local ecology. Um, that includes native plants, culturally diverse varieties, and those that offer unique sensory experiences. One of our highlights of the teaching garden is our pawpaw trees. If you hadn't have a, had a pawpaw, please try to make it out to try one if they fall from a tree when you're there. Uh, but this, but pawpaw spark conversations about our industrial food system versus our local food system. Um, and then we also feature native plant species that encourage everyone to try new fruits. Maybe this is your first time hearing about a pawpaw. Um, and then with our greenhouse pictured, we are able to cultivate tropical plants like ginger, turmeric, lufa, which is really exciting. Um, and then bitter melon, which they each have their own historical significance. Um, and then this year we successfully grew flint corn, which is the type commonly used for making popcorn. So when we're crop selecting, we're also keeping those aspects in mind. All right, and last but certainly not least, we come to the practice of seed saving. So seed saving is a vital tool for resilient gardeners, especially talking about the in the context of climate change. It provides an opportunity to develop plant strains that are uniquely suited to your local environment. So maybe that flint corn that did really well, we want to save those seeds and plant them for next year. Um, so that that enhances seeds' abilities to thrive in changing conditions. Um, it also allows us to resurrect or create unique varieties that may have become rare or lost over time. And then beyond those practical benefits, seed saving also serves as a powerful educational tool. So it offers valuable lessons in agricultural practices, bi biology, and ecology. Um, it also connects us with the timeless wisdom of our ancestors who depended on these practices for their survival. Um, and then also it, it fosters a sense of community by giving birth to a seed library, which we created our very own this year at the Teaching Garden, and it's been a huge success. Um, it's not just a collection of seeds, it's a living testament to our commitment to sharing knowledge and resources. Um, and we're also able to uh, provide a place where we teach and learn about equity, food justice, and food sovereignty, which are all really great lessons to teach students. Um, and then, uh, so tomorrow we're actually doing a seed saving lesson with our six and eighth, six to eighth graders. So this year we have the privilege of growing um, a variety of watermelon called Alibaba watermelon. Um, we are going to work with students to preserve some of these seeds um, and they'll also be able to taste a new variety of watermelon, which is really exciting. So through lessons of seed saving, you're able to harvest and save a variety of seeds from school, your school garden or local producers. You're able to explain why seed saving is important for genetic diversity, um, describe how seeds are formed, 
identify a variety of seeds and also taste really delicious produce grown by hopefully you. So just to summarize uh, everything we talked about really quickly, um, today we started um, learning about the effects of climate change on gardens, which will generally be warmer and shorter winters and more extreme weather events. We talked about how to adapt your garden for a changing climate uh, by focusing on crop selection, pest management, and location considerations. And we've talked about how you can use these topics for education in a light and meaningful way to inspire others to play a role in climate change mitigation. So does anybody have any questions? We answered a few questions in the chat and I'm not sure, Laura, can everybody see the answers or just the people who asked those questions? I'm not sure actually if everyone can see the answered questions. Um, maybe someone in the chat could let us know if they're able to see the answered questions. Um, everyone can see, great. So we had some good questions about um, curriculum, which we shared. Uh, GrowNYCEducation.org has lots of helpful resources for um, school gardens and teachers. Any other questions before we wrap up or anything that we maybe cut short that you wanted to hear a little more about? Laura, can you um, put up the next slide? It has our email addresses. I know there were a couple of times that I said, if you're interested and you want more information, this is uh, my email address along with Eve and Aubrey. Um, please feel free to reach out to us if we skimmed over something that piqued your interest or if you'd like to hear more about uh, what we're doing at the Teaching Garden. I'll also throw um, our school gardens email in the chat in case there's anyone on the call who is interested in getting support for a school garden. So I know we have a lot of ed educators in there, so I'd be happy to connect with you as well. And people are asking, can you put all of the links into the slideshow? So what I'll, what I'll end up doing is I will download the slideshow and email it out to everyone. So you'll have all the links, you'll be able to click on them um, when I send it out, which will probably be tomorrow. And the recording of the workshop as well will be available tomorrow. So you'll all be getting an email. All right, well, I guess that's about it. It was wonderful um, to do this workshop with you all. We have some more workshops coming up as well. Um, so in that email that I sent to you, the same place where you signed up on Eventbrite for this workshop, you can see our other workshops. Speaking of seed saving, we just published a seed saving workshop that will be in person for educators um, in October. So we have that coming up um, as well as some other cool events. So definitely stay connected with us. Check out that email that I send out because it'll have everything in there. And thank you all for a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.